Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and, and welcome to this afternoon's breakout session on public expenditure as a common good. Um, it's great to see so many of you here. Uh, just before I introduce the session, just a couple of really quick housekeeping points. Uh, the session is being recorded, so if you don't want to be recorded, then please ensure that your audio and video remain switched off. Um, if I could ask all delegates to please keep yourselves on mute during the speaker presentations. Um, we do want to hear from you, though, throughout the session, so please let us know who you are and where you're from by putting your name and your organisation's details in the chat. And we'll have time later in the session for comments and a Q&A with the panel. If you've got any technical issues, just let us know in the chat and we'll, we'll do our best to help you. And as Sarah said this morning, we're asking everyone to reflect um, throughout the summit on what they're learning and how they could put that into action. So uh, if, if you get inspired with any really good, what can I do on Mondays? Uh, make sure that you complete the form that we'll put in the chat now. And we may call on you in the, in the final session on Friday. We've got a really fantastic panel today. Our two speakers, Hugh Thomas and Ellen Petz, and uh, additional panel member, Sarah Evans. Hugh Thomas is the Director of Finance for Howell Valley University Health Board. Claire has been working really closely with Hugh and his team over the last year or so on developing and embedding a community wealth building approach, which aims to maximise the health board's contributions, both economically, socially and environmentally, as a really significant anchor organisation in South West Wales. Ellen Petz is the Managing Director of Greenstream Flooring CIC, a really innovative, long-term circular economy social enterprise. Their mission is to maximise the community benefit of the reuse and sales of flooring, providing a national waste and resource collection of commercial carpet tiles during refurbishments and construction phases. We're also really fortunate to have Sarah Evans on the panel. Sarah is the Wales Cooperative Centre's Commercial Director. Uh, Claire's and Wales Co-ops have been working quite closely in Wales over the last 18 months or so. And Sarah's got really extensive knowledge and understanding about the cooperative and social enterprise sectors and a real passion for promoting and mainstreaming those sectors in our local economies. So just before I hand over to the first speaker, just a, a few quick comments from me to, to set the context for today's discussion. Public spending and particularly a kind of focus on, on what we would call progressive procurement approaches is perhaps one of the best uh, and well-known tools of the community wealth building toolkit. It's um, often the area that anchor organisations focus on first when starting out on their community wealth building journey. But the impact of anchor spending can go far beyond just kind of technical tinkering to the procurement processes, social value clauses, or kind of nice to haves. It can harbour a deeper and more systemic change that really rewires the local economy to place its ownership more firmly in the hands of local communities. So I think how we think about the impact of spending is maturing, uh, going beyond procurement, more upstream to service design and commissioning. And the aim is to use anchor spending to support a transition to a more generative economy. And in that context, um, enterprise ownership and purpose really matter. So a key objective should be to use anchor spending to support and grow the social enterprise and cooperative sector, and to increase the contribution of those sectors to the wider commercial economy. We're in an era, aren't we, of, of multiple and overlapping crises, whether it's rampant inequalities, the climate and ecological emergency, or just the vulnerabilities of our local economies to the kind of vagaries of the global economy and financial markets. So it's increasingly important that anchor spending seeks to address multiple problems. That requires, I think, anchor organisations to be bolder, really prioritising partnerships with suppliers that can not only deliver the goods and services that a buyer might need, but can do that in ways which systematically address some of those wider social and environmental issues. So both of our speakers today are from very different perspectives, I think right at the forefront of that agenda. Um, please feel free to post any questions or comments in the chat while you're listening to our speakers. And we'll try and get to as many of those as we can in the panel discussion. 
Um, so on that note, it gives me great pleasure to hand over to our first speaker, Hugh Thomas, Director of Finance at Howard Eye University Health Board. John, thank you very much and uh, um, really good to be joining you from a, um, a slightly overcast uh, West Wales uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm just going to talk a bit about uh, us as an organisation, my approach and the, the way in which we've been approaching uh, working with CLES and working on uh, building wealth for our communities. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get into more discussion uh, later. Um, I'm the Director of Finance for uh, Holdar, and I've also got Remit for Digital and Performance, and as part of that, procurement naturally uh, forms part of my uh, thinking, and very much at the start of the pandemic, when we were all struggling with uh, PPE and finding PPE for our uh, staff, um, I just realised that we needed to be thinking about our supply chain in a different way. Uh, and coincidentally, not long after, I, I was reading a book by Mariana Mazzucato, and she's clearly um, done a lot of work and a lot of thinking in terms of uh, the entrepreneurial state and the role in which um, the state and the private sector have to come together to think collectively about spend on, on its big objectives and how we can maximise the benefit to society from that. A, a, a really, um, really powerful author, actually, that's uh, worth either listening to on a TED talk or, or actually picking up an old fashioned book. So um, I, um, I'm, I'm the director of finance here uh, and uh, the health system in Wales is a devolved system, devolved from the UK government and it's structured slightly differently. So just a bit of background for us, we're one of seven health boards in Wales with a sticky out bit on the bottom of, of Wales. Uh, we have um, three uh, local authorities, Ceredigion, Carmarthenshire and Pembrokeshire uh, that we cover and we're responsible for everything essentially for uh, our population. So um, planning and commissioning primary and tertiary services and long-term care and we provide community and secondary services and we work alongside our three local authorities. We're responsible for about 384,000 residents and our spend is somewhere in the region of £920 million a year. Last year was significantly more than that uh, as a result of the pandemic. And I mentioned Mariano Mazzucato because that really was a, a, a moment in time for me where I thought quite differently about um, our role as a, an anchor institution. It brought it to life for me in a way that we can do, um, do work differently. And I think the approach that I've taken is, is um, to focus on shifting a mindset within the health board, shifting our thinking into recognizing the importance of this work. Uh, then working on the skill set and the tool set almost as subsidiary elements of that and um, developing alongside CLES, uh, helping us the skill set of our te teams to think differently in this space and working on the tool set that's available to our teams to deliver uh, on this agenda. And it's shifted our thinking from thinking about procurement in particular, but um, there are uh, other elements I'll come on to, from price to value and historically accountants and um, price equals value uh, we've we've actually moved on in that thinking now from seeing this as an opportunity to create value for society and value more broadly uh, for the people that we're here to represent and work for so we focus on this as as building social value and, and building community wealth and that that focus has shifted us into thinking about ch changing the relative importance that people place on the experiences that they uh, have locally and, and generating greater resilience to our local communities. But I would hesitate to add that uh, I would uh, certainly add that we are at the early stages of this work. Um, so there's much to do. So if I just outline our approach, firstly, we've started off with a baseline of intelligence. And we've been working to understand what do our communities look like? We span quite a big geography. We have uh, probably about a third of Wales's landmass uh, and a res relatively small proportion of the population, 10% uh, percent of the population. So a big geography, but reasonably small population. 
So intelligence has become quite a, a, a crucial uh, element of the way in which we're thinking about this and understanding the needs of our communities in terms of the deprivation uh, that they are facing across the whole um, of the seven uh, well-being goals in the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act. So I'll come on to what the Act broadly covers, but that's given us an understanding at quite a granular level, uh, at ward level, then a lower super output level. Uh, and that's been an incredibly helpful piece of work to guide our thinking, to make sure that we are focused at our most deprived areas. I mentioned the seven well-being goals there. And um, those seven goals are a prosperous Wales, resilient Wales, healthier Wales, more equal Wales, cohesive community, um, thriving Welsh language, and a globally responsible Wales. So you'll recognise that in those seven well-being objectives, there's an immense amount of flexibility. And historically, we've kind of struggled to operationalise that uh, act within the way in which we work. Working with CLEs, we've been able to, to kind of get a, a sense of how we can operationalise those requirements and how we can really use our spend to steer it. And we focused on procurement, workforce, and our physical assets in particular in, uh, in, in addressing uh, that to, to look at broadly how we, um, how we deliver uh, community wealth. So if I focus down on, on procurement, um, there is a danger sometimes that you can become overly parochial in this way of thinking. But we identified quite quickly through, um, through our intelligence that there are 500 Welsh companies who supply the NHS in England, but don't supply the NHS in Wales, which felt like a daft place for us to be. So we've kind of, we're starting by just looking at what on earth has gone wrong in, in the way in which we've approached the market historically to see how we can use those 500 native Welsh companies to direct their spend into Wales as well as England. Um, that's the overarching kind of work that we've been doing. Then across to us in, in West Wales, we've focused down on where can we make the biggest difference? Now, we don't have a big industrial um, heartland in West Wales, actually. You've got some work in Llanelli, but um, we're, we're not an area that has historically attracted industry. So we've really focused on food as an opportunity. I do apologise, someone's trying to call me. Uh, we've focused on food as an opportunity because we are um, a big kind of food growing um, part of the of the country and worked with a key supplier in Castellawell Foods to look at how can we not only get breadth of local food supply chain, but depth within um, the supply chain through Castellawell. And that, that approach, working with them, they've come on board and they've really embraced this way of, of thinking. So it, it, that element of shifting mindset, I think, has become um, in, incredibly important in getting uh, a very key commercial anchor institution to uh, work alongside us. Then shifting that on into areas like uh, recruitment and um, staffing, we've developed um, our own apprenticeship academy, really focusing and targeting our recruitment effort into um, the more deprived areas of our community. We've looked at Grow Your Own. So we are moving people through a pipeline. So if they start as a healthcare support worker, we are supporting those healthcare support workers to become registered nurses, uh, as an example. And that Grow Your Own scheme has become incredibly important to us in making sure we're growing um, talent within our local communities, using quite actively using volunteers and work experience opportunities to bring people in, give them an understanding of uh, what health can provide and the diversity of roles that health can provide. Uh, and then particularly targeted work through um, COVID uh, and targeting on um, uh, recruitment of additional staff uh, through the last few months or through the last couple of years has, has given us a, a wealth of information into um, the needs of, of recruitment and how you can address the needs of people coming into the organisation in a different way. Then moving on to our physical estate and our physical assets, um, we are uh, embarking on quite a big transformational programme in terms of our estate and uh, embedding in that um, 
uh, uh, work with our supply chain quite um, quite proactively in estate design and build, making sure that the estate is used in the most um, uh, effective way from a local procurement perspective, but also from an environmental perspective and, and its uh, ongoing maintenance. But the one bit that I haven't spoken about yet is the opportunity we've got on uh, using our intellectual assets. Our intellectual assets haven't been maximized in the past in this space. So if I go back to Clez's kind of approach of financial assets, actually it didn't apply so much in, in health. We weren't able to use our financial assets in the way in which I would have hoped. So we've looked at our intellectual assets instead and brought together R&D with our three local universities, with the broader network of um, health providers uh, in Wales and developed an institute called Tritech, which brings all of that together and allows us to um, work more constructively with, um, with uh, pharmaceutical companies, with biotech firms, with technology firms uh, to bring different routes to uh, working with a, what can be a big bureaucratic uh, health service. And what we've seen from that is a, a, a growth in um, research funding into West Wales, not an area that would have historically attracted it, a sense that we can act as a, a startup, so a kind of almost a hunger to do things differently, and uh, an opportunity to um, bring in more high quality paid jobs into this community. So that's probably where I would pause for the moment, John, just uh, giving a flavour of the work that we've done till now. Thank you, Hugh. That, that's really fantastic. And I think for me, a, a number of things that struck me from what you said, Hugh. One really interesting, I think, is the distinction you make between mindset and tool set. And that, that's really, really important. Uh, another for me is, is how you, you know, you're adopting that kind of whole organisational approach. Um, so even thinking about, for example, you know, that link to your R&D uh, kind of functions and spending really as a kind of innovation investment in, in the local economy. And the, the third point that struck me is it's really about the whole totality of your spending. So not just the procurement spend, uh, but also your kind of commission services, the spend on your workforce and your major capital programmes and so on. So a lot of food for thought there. Um, Feel free to post questions as they come to you in the chat and we'll have some time uh, after our little breakout sessions to, 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 to float some of those back to you and the other panel members. Um, I, I'm, if I can just now introduce uh, our next speaker, um, Ellen Petz, who's Managing Director of Greenstream Flooring CIC. Um, Ellen presented in a, in a social enterprise event that Sarah Evans had organised in Cumtaff and Bridge End a few months ago. And, uh, I was just really blown away by the ethos of her organisation and the impact um, of their work. So I'm really grateful to Ellen for being here to share that with you today. So over to you, Ellen. Hi, and uh, and, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation. Can Firstly, can everybody hear me clearly? Cool. OK. Um, uh, as, as John said, um, I uh, set up a social enterprise um, some 12, 13 years ago now um, in a material area that I knew absolutely nothing about, which was flooring. Um, and one, one word of advice, never set up a business with a, a material you know nothing about and actually you know nothing about business at all. So anyway, steep learning curve, but um, it was always based on the belief that um, there was this material that is a waste material and that that could create community value, that could create community wealth. Um, and we set about doing that um, since 2008 um, and it's not been an easy ride. However, what community wealth has actually meant to us in terms of a practical and in terms of a value-led social enterprise is that, um, and I'll go back, I'll talk about our core services first, that anybody who doesn't know what we are or who we are, um, we're a fairly small social enterprise. Uh, we now have 15 employees. Uh, we set up in 2008 um, and um, we, we're doing okay as such. We're established, we've gone 
past the sort of the bumpy ride area and we've now been working with local authorities and the housing associations to, a, to various degrees for about seven, eight years, I would say. Um, the services that we supply are commercial supply and fit services with our flooring, um, always with the core aim of waste minimization at the heart of it. I set up very much this organization around the value first and foremost of minimizing waste. So um, compared to a standard flooring contractor, we actually try and sell less flooring than more flooring. We always look at reuse first, and that goes on to our second service, which is um, we run a national collection of com for commercial carpet tiles that otherwise would be thrown away, um, and they get uh, converted into a community resource. Uh, and by that, I mean, um, yes, we sell a lot um, on eBay and we're very proficient, and that's where our income comes in. But on the back of that, we donate thousands of square meters a year to, uh, to help alleviate the issue of uh, carpet poverty, um, which unfortunately is a huge issue in this country, which is under the radar, as no social housing um, organization has a statutory duty to supply flooring. So the two services again are our supply and fit service and our waste recovery service. Um, and the value that they bring, being a value-led organization, which I would argue that every social enterprise is a value-led organization, is that they create um, opportunities for um, learning, for employment, for wealth creation in terms of bringing people who are otherwise, and I hate the word work disadvantage into our workplace, to be involved with the turning round of that waste material and converting it into a waste opportunity. So we have a team, we have two warehouses now, um, and we have um, a number of, of people working in those warehouses who sort, separate, recreate, and regrade that material for use in all of our different markets, which one of them is, the, um, is this donation area where we're providing basic warmth and human dignity and insulation to people who otherwise are living on wood and cement floors. And, and even in new developments, that's, that's very often the case, um, which is fairly shocking. Um, so our core services are very much value led, value led around the environmental um, outputs that we are achieving, which is around converting uh, an otherwise waste material into a um, community resource. Um, social, in terms of the, the people that we're bringing in and the people that we're providing one-to-one -one employability services to. Um, and we run um, a program, for example, called Better Greener, where um, we have up to eight people on various cohorts and they are, they are provided with reuse and recovery training. And also they're provided with um, pathways support going, going forward. Um, so going on to uh, a bit more about our experience in terms of where we're at and where we've developed in terms of our markets. As I mentioned before, we, we have, um, fairly good experience of working with local authorities and housing associations, but it's not been easy and it, and it continues not to be easy. Um, and um, with all the goodwill in the world, you can have great conversations at a high level, um, but we have found a number of uh, real barriers to, to this issue that are really true to even a larger social and a more established social enterprise. So it's very hard to see how setups can be encouraged. One of our biggest barriers, um, which I'm sure you're all aware of, is, is the supply chain and the way the supply chain is not open to, um, to supply, to sub subcontractors within the supply chain. Uh, we found, um, because our, um, our services are mainly provided through uh, design and build contracts, or, um, or some kind of construction level contracts, that once that goes out on a format, um, on a, you know, we're very, uh, you know, we're, we're quite um, efficient at being part of, of being onto those platforms. And, and when I say platforms, I mean procurement platforms. Um, we find that um, 
the opportunity is lost because it goes out to a initial contractor and they have no obligation whatsoever to advertise that more fully um, and to follow the values that sometimes the, the commissioner has actually intentionally put in there. And there's been a number of cases over the last few years that, you know, I've had very positive meetings with commissioners who've said to me, oh, you yeah, know, we really want to involve you because of the social and the environmental value that we bring to the, par the party. And uh, the contracts, the larger contracts being one, and they're not interested in working with us. They've already got whoever they, they, they they're really not interested, the, the actual tender, uh, con the, the successful contractor. So the supply chain and the, the way that that's not open is a real challenge to an organization like us. Um, so we've we've worked on, I would say, our main in to local authorities and to, to housing associations and similar has been through personal connections. And those connections you have to drive and those connections have to be driven as well to really want to connect you. And I don't mean you have a positive conversation and there's a sort of a will there. What I actually mean is they, they need to see it through they, and they need to see it through the supply chain and they need to keep a really close eye. And that's where I believe that procurement is not a barrier. Procurement is actually a positive in this. If they've got procurement on board and procurement can word it in a way that is allows that openness to an organization like us, then um, you've actually got an opportunity that's real. Um, and breaking up those contracts into the smaller areas is absolutely key. If you don't see what we call the CPV codes on, on sell to Wales or similar, um, and they're not broken out, there's absolutely no chance an organization can, can be engaged. So, um, you know, it's, 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 it's positive. We're in a positive context. I really feel that there's a real will around this area. And I really welcome, um, in fact, the fact that Claire's actually um, is engaged in this conversation. Uh, and, you know, we as a practitioner on the ground are really, um, you know, buoyed up by the positive context that is here. And maybe, you know, 10, 12 years ago, wasn't so much. Um, however, there's still a long way to go. Um, and I think what, what is needed is proper real conversations that are around particular contexts, particular opportunities, and to really see how these things can be pushed through um, the, com the complexities that, that exist. Um, and, uh, you know, it, it's hard work, but it's, uh, it's positive. So, um, yeah, that's it for me at the moment. <laughs> Any questions, please ask away. That's fantastic, Ellen. Thank you. Really, really inspiring stuff. And, and just such a fantastic blend of the kind of commercial, social, the environmental. And it kind of begs the question for me for kind of public sector buyers, why, why wouldn't you have a kind of social business first sort of approach? But but also I think what Ellen's presentation there really highlighted is, is the need for that relational approach to procurement uh, really got to get into those kind of deep relationships with the social business sectors in in your local areas and and what an opportunity cost if those sort of supply chain issues kind of can't be solved or can't be ironed out so a lot of food for thought there uh, what what we're going to do now is is break you out into smaller groups uh, about four groups i think for uh, 15 to 20 minutes and what we want you to do is just reflect on and discuss the presentations that you've just listened to uh, and we'd like you to um, try and answer two questions uh, and we'll post those questions in the, in the chat in the moment so that the first is is how can we kind of make the case um, to extend who's involved in the spending pillar of community wealth building beyond just procurement teams how do we really get that whole organizational approach and then the second question is, um, what are the barriers or, or, or stumbling blocks for using anchor spending to really grow the social enterprise sector and make that more of a mainstream approach? 
Um, so if each of your breakout groups could start by nominating one person from your group to feed back to the main session, that would be really helpful. And um, we will see you back in uh, about 15 to 20 minutes in the main session to feed back and have a discussion with our full panel. Hey, welcome back, everyone. I think I think we've got everyone back. Um, if if my uh, breakout group was anything to go by, we've got some really, really rich, powerful discussions there. So um, if I could ask briefly uh, somebody from each group to to quickly feedback. Um, have we got somebody from group one? We were group one, John. <clears throat> I think. So that's me, Matthew uh, Thompson from Cornwall and crowdfunder. Um, so John asked us two questions. Um, how do we embed a whole organization approach in spending? And how do we do more generally on anchor spending in particular? Um, and we talked about the importance of the holistic view that we want authorities to have being more than just about spending, but actually being deep cultural. Um, we talked about uh, the example of Wigan. Um, where it was about values and behaviours um, and, and driving that, that understanding of what the authority is for in a place. And if we don't get that happening, then we won't get the spending happening, right? Um, uh, Vari uh, from, I think, Ayrshire um, talked about how important it was to stitch together a really close relationship between the business development team and the procurement team. So not just to load up um, procurement uh, officers, um, and indeed there, they invested in a new role that straddled the two directorates. So just again, just practical attempts to break down the silos. Uh, we, we did all acknowledge that there are silos, even if they're not felt inside the organization, you can see them from the outside of the organization. Um, and um, we, uh, Maureen talked about uh, another Scottish example of um, an 18 month exercise of participatory budgeting, just starting to break down some of those internal barriers um, by just shining a light and getting the community more involved in, in setting um, spending agendas as being ways of doing that. Uh, Jim um, brought into uh, play the importance of having working academic models, you know, that so what's the role of the higher education institutions, both as anchor spends, but also in terms of bringing in kind of professional discipline to understanding the impacts we want to see and understanding that, that they are being made. Um, that's probably the summary. Thank you, Matthew. Brilliant. Um, somebody from breakout group two. Hi, oh, yeah, yeah, that's me, James White. So um, a couple of points from us was um, understanding the differences between commissioning and procurement um, and looking at the, uh, the wider benefits of, of, of the spend um, and trying to move away from a culture of um, of cost cutting and also looking at um and so we, we mentioned we talked about gap analysis and understanding what our communities can offer and where we were spending our money um and uh, there was a point made that co-production is at the heart of this and to understand what the community what the community can offer to us that was it. fantastic thank you james um Group three. Hello, John. Uh, Conrad Park here from Claire's. We, yeah, we, we managed to get quite a really great wide ranging conversation in. Uh, in terms of embedding community wealth building, Daniel gave us an example, I think, in Manchester. Sorry if I've misrepresented you about the local authority having a community wealth building task force that brings in people from across all departments to embed community wealth building, not just in procurement but in many different disciplines. And we had a fascinating example from Victoria from Australia about their indigenous procurement policy and a policy that's been put in place that allows people to go direct to businesses, indigenously led businesses. And that the whole process is facilitated through the website. Uh, we said it's something that might be really worth studying. Uh, and broadly speaking, we had a broader conversation about this mismatch the anchor institutions and the social enterprise sector and the need for some sort of brokerage that could raise awareness that could add to the lacking capacity of procurement teams to stay out there and build relationships and become familiar with the market and then finally we ended up thinking that the problem of value over cost even though the value of community wealth building 
is appreciated, costs still tend to end in a time of austerity and budget cutting. Brilliant, thank you, comrade. And did we have a group four? I think we had four groups. Okay, so that's my that's ours. I wasn't sure about which number is mine. <laughs> oh, it's the last one. Good. Uh, my group was Marty, Manila, Nicola, um, and Sophie. So we had a very interesting conversation as well. Um, thinking about how it can get out of recruitment and cross over the whole organization. We talk about the importance of leadership. So try to make the conversation in the strategic level as long as possible, even though we need to go into the tool set and make it happen. It's important to make sure we also make the linkages with the strategy. So some examples is looking at how uh, procurement could be a tool to deliver strategic goals of service areas and make sure the linkage, the languages are in the right place so people can identify themselves and and, and get ownership of the process. It's not only procurement, but it's good for the whole organization. We get commissioners on board since the beginning. We talk about there is a role for everyone in this policy. Um, and a final comment really interesting is when you have community wealth building and social value implications on uh, staff reports or performance reports. So is in the office, uh, any officer radar any employee radar, you know, you need to deliver on those topics as well. And about anchor spectator, we said, said the first point actually is listening and engaging with the community, understanding actually what are the possibilities to engage there and, and make those connections. We also talk about barriers, how difficult it is for some anchor institutions to work with procurement in the local level in place-based purchasing some of them, they had the national frameworks and it's already set and centralized at the national level. Um, and Hum used an award that he actually, he doesn't like anchor institution term as he thinks we should move into a propeller. We should be power institutions in all that static as anchor may uh, implies. Yeah, that's it. That's brilliant. Um, I love I love that propeller institutions. I think I think we'll use that. That's absolutely fantastic. That sounds like there's some really excellent discussions, and there's a, a couple of um, themes there that I think across that I'd be really interested to kind of explore with the panel. So what, one was about that kind of developing that understanding about the kind of social business landscape in your area and who's got the time and capacity to build those um, relationships. I, I wonder if I could. Um, bring Sarah Evans in to get a kind of sector perspective, really, from certainly from the from, from the Welsh perspective, Sarah, on uh, the, the relationship between the social enterprise sector and local authorities. Uh, it, 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 I get the sense it can be difficult sometimes to understand which door to knock on, and uh, I'd just be interested in your perspective on that. Yeah, I, th I think that's very true, John, and I think sometimes you, you can't always do it alone. I, you know, I think we've heard from Ellen and I think we're all very sure Ellen will keep knocking on that door and that's why we've got her here today. But I, you know, I think, I think it is, you know, th there are time constraints that, that that was brought out, I think, in, in the discussion we, we just had um, with Conrad. And, you know, but I do think that there are opportunities to get to know your social enterprise, your social business sector in your locality. You know, there's organisations in Wales, we've got organisations such as ourselves running Social Business Wales that, that can point you in the right direction that, you know, but we are seeing, I, I think in Wales, we've got 22 different local authorities, we've got seven local health boards, all operate quite differently. But I think, you know, to me, the Claire's work, as I said at the panel this morning, I think that door is opening. I think we've heard that from Hugh. I think we've heard that from Ellen. So pointing around my screen, they're in those directions. And, you know, I think as a sector, we, we've got to make the most of it. Conrad was saying about the work that's going on in Birmingham and, you know, maybe how there's a bit of a mis mismatch about what the sector can offer and, you know, maybe what the public sector wants. But I think we've got to work to say, wow, you, you can pivot and do something different and I, I think that's what we need to keep that momentum up yeah no that's that's brilliant I think another theme for me that that is very much linked to that is that there's um I think there's an awful lot asked of the procurement profession 
you know, they're, they're expected to deliver across multiple agendas, but they're really at the end of a, at the end of a process. And, and something that I think came out from across the feedback from the different breakout groups there was how do you engage more people across the organization? So, uh, and how do you do that earlier so that we start to think about um, building in, thinking about social enterprise in the kind of service design and commissioning space. And in Hugh, I know it's early days in, in how old are, but that's very much uh, your intention in the health board to get that organisational approach. I'd just be interested in, in your reflections really on uh, what your aspirations are for that and, and what you think might unlock it or make that work. Yeah, thank you. And look, there's a, a, a challenge for us here in terms of needing to find those people in organisations who are passionate and who have influence, who are able to make sure that the the whole organisation comes along with you, um, or at least you know decent sized chunks of it. So um, that that's that's a an inherent kind of challenge when you're trying to engage with the public sector. We are big, clunky, difficult organisations to engage with, uh, and. I think my observation, and I keep coming back to this mindset, skill set, tool set thing, um, because th th that mindset bit is critical. It's very easy to get into saying actually procurement rules are difficult and it's very difficult to, to do this within the current procurement rules. If you've shifted the mindset in an organization, you'll find a way around those rules. They are part of this tool set and skill set bit. Um, so I'm I'm in, in engaging with uh, industry now, I'm keen to really push the boundaries of, uh, but, but this depends on the, an organizational risk appetite, but I'm really keen to push the boundaries so that, you know, historically we've gone with a 70-30 split of, of um, finance and quality. Actually, I want to split that down into a third quality, a third finance and a third social value and really give social value that we are working on a an edge here and be very specific in what we want from that um, social value contribution. Now that gives us the lever to require um, uh, social enterprises to be part of a delivery framework, to require that there is a part of the supply chain that focuses very much on um, bringing in local benefit that, that's out with necessarily local procurement but can bring in benefit to our um, communities. Again, it's back to appetite, it's back to leadership in that space. Thank you, Hugh. Um, one of the other themes that, that came out there was that the need to build relationships between different functions in anchor organisations. So particularly between procurement and business support. Um, and I think it'd be interesting to get the perspective from each of the three panelists on this, because um, I'll start with Ellen, because Ellen, in our breakout group, you were, you were talking about the, the, the need that some social enterprises have to, to be supported in order to grow and some of the challenges around the cost of accreditation and so on. It'd be really, uh, I think it'd be really interesting for you to, to share that in this in, in, in the main group, because I think that was really instructive. Yeah, I was just picking up from, um, uh, I think it was Maureen in our, in our group talking uh, about her experience in Scotland um, and, and she highlighted the fact that uh, part of their, um, their their overall strategy involves um, them actually seeking out social enterprises that might not be perfect from day one, but actually have the potential to be perfect for them to provide services. So it, and I, and I from, from our own perspective, you know, it, it's been a big journey for us and, you know, we're well established, et cetera, et cetera, 12, 13 years on. But you know, five years ago, we wouldn't have been in 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 the in the space that we. I wouldn't have been in even been able to be part of this conversation because, um, you know, we weren't ready, and that there, there wasn't, you know, it's not easy for us to access um, the levels of support that we require. And if we had a sort of mentor from our local authority or a mentor from our local health board, for example, that yes, we can't currently work with because xyz but there's a will to um and there are opportunities identified that you know are smaller opportunities that that allow us an in for example then let's work together to try and achieve those over to over an agreed period of time and i think you know that sort of mentor support work um with 
with that general will that you know being there would be a really positive thing and and is a positive potential I think and it's, um, and I can't see that that isn't impossible myself um because as I say we've got the overall particularly in Wales we've got the overall positive sort of um levers and I just, just think it's some practical elements of that um could result in some real growth in the social enterprise sector frankly um yeah so yeah yeah, brilliant. Thank you, Alan. Hugh, uh, I'd be interested in your perspective. Uh, I guess uh, your situation is slightly different than a local authority anchor, and you span three local authorities, each with their own business support functions, and also have a, a relationship with, with Welsh government and national Welsh organisations. Uh, what, what challenges this, th does that present for you as an anchor organisation, really trying to kind of champion the role of, of social enterprise in relation to your spend? Yeah. Look, anything that introduces complexity introduces challenges and having three local authorities in your region with three different approaches to business development um, there are two economic regions that we straddle so there's a mid and west wales region that keradigion is a part of or the mid wales growth region and then there's this one bay kind of city deal economic region for and the other two local authorities that gives you inherent complexity which mm -hmm. makes my job quite challenging because this is only a part of my overall responsibility while i'm mm -hmm. passionate about it actually I've, I've also got a job to manage the budget for the organization so um there is th th those those the more the more the more levers you have the more challenges you have especially if they're smaller levers um, the relationship we've got with with Welsh government is brilliant. You know, um, th there is a closeness between government and um, delivery in Wales. I'm sure it's probably replicated in Scotland as well. Um, that you have in a devolved administration that is much more difficult in England, having worked there mm -hmm. as well, uh, and and that's a, a really really strong opportunity for us. Um, but but yeah, complexity makes things quite challenging. I'm not sure I can I can add more really other than we try and overcome them um, and and that's where relationships become important I guess you know that's that's why you know you you do need to have a number of conversations but those relationships become quite important but they inherently introduce a different way of doing things so I can't do things in a unified health board way I will go at the open doors so if one local authority is more open than the others to working with us then I'll go there yeah. Uh, and that is in itself introducing a degree of inequity. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. Thank you, Hugh. And, and Sarah, I'd be interested from a kind of sector perspective on, on some of that around the relationships with uh, the different sort of support functions that, that are out there across this landscape. Yeah, yeah, we've, um, I said this morning, we've, we, in Wales, all of the support organisations, we've really tried to be working together so that we're, we're speaking with, with a more considered voice and thinking how the sector can really, really grow and develop. And, you know, I do, I do think we've done kind of meet the buyer events, we've kind of, but I'm really taking in what people are saying about this kind of brokerage idea. And I, th I think this is something that you know, we could we could really take forward. And Ellen, your point about the mentoring support again, I think that's an element that that through Social Business Wales we could we could really be working on. And I, I think it's you know the conversations we're listening to to today, it's keeping those going. And one thing that I think we haven't talked about today is maybe some of the community renewal funding that's come out. You know, luckily, maybe you were able to benefit from it. Those of you uh, around the screen from local authorities, you know, we, we've been involved in a couple of different projects. And again, this is, I think it gives us another opportunity as, as another in to kind of shape the enterprise and the skills within our local areas. That's great. And it, it, that sort of reminds me really a bit of when at the start of the pandemic, when when Claire's published a publication called Own the Future, uh, which I'm sure some of you would have read, we, we kind of made this distinction between um, the kind of foundational sectors, whether we felt there's a real opportunity to think about the role that social kind of local community really locally rooted organisations can have in providing more kind of resilience in the local economy. 
um, uh, as opposed to those uh, kind of what we call reform sectors. So maybe the sectors of your economies that are more dominated by some of the more extractive players. And that provides an opportunity to think about, well, how do we really more proactively focus on trying to create more generative alternatives to those extractive players in the market or where we see uh, particular dysfunctions in our local economies? Uh, and then, the, you know, there's the kind of high the, or the new growth sectors out there, particularly opportunities around the green economy and kind of just transition. And, and how, how do we make sure that we, we manage that transition in a, in a way uh, that doesn't just further fuel wealth extraction from our local economies, but really kind of uh, roots those benefits in our, in our local communities. Um, so it's been a brilliant discussion. I'm, I'm conscious of the time. I, I think it's probably all we've, we've we've got time for this afternoon it's it's been a an absolutely fantastic discussion um just before we go um, a reminder for delegates who, who've not done so to book uh, your places on a workshop for tuesday wednesday or thursday uh and we'll put a link in in the chat to do that uh also a final plug for any of your what can we do on Mon mondays i think the link's already in in the chat um Today's session has been recorded. Um, we'll share a link for you to view the recording uh, next week. Um, and if I could just finish by uh, thanking our panel members today, Sarah, Ellen and Hugh. Um, thank you also to our partners, the Barrow Cabri Trust, the Democracy Collaborative and um, Power to Change. Uh, and thank you all for your attendance and contributions. And um, I hope that you enjoy the rest of the summit. See you later in the week. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Thank bye you. Bye. Bye.